everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 83 of the Movement Debrief. And tonight, folks, we got one that is going to be off the heezy for sheezy, as the young kids say. We're going to talk about shoulder limitations, a specific case of shoulder limitations, because sometimes the shoulder motion is limited off of your typical conventional pattern. So what you going to do about it? Stay tuned. We're going to talk about breathing starting positions. You got someone who's got a wild and crazy funky ribcage presentation. Where should I start to minimize the funkiness? I'll give you the answer. And last but not least, we're going to talk about a trainer's role in persistent pain. Do you, the personal trainer, the strength conditioning coach, do you have a role in someone who has been in pain for an extended period of time? These answers will be answered tonight because these are all questions that have been asked from the people, answered for the people by this people right here, Fam Recognize Fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Mark, and Mark types. Hey Zach, have you ever spoke about significantly limited bilateral horizontal abduction and internal rotation of the shoulder? I understand it's not typical. I'm just trying to get the mechanics straight in my head. Mark, great question. This is a doozy. So, where Mark is struggling is typically or conventionally, I should say, or maybe unconventionally, depending on who you learn from, horizontal abduction, which is the, the humorous breaking the table down um, towards the ground if you're on your back, right? It's kind of like a rotation of the shoulder in the pure transverse plane. And external rotation, high five position, are often simultaneously limited. And the reason for this limitation is because the fibers of the subscapularis, which have an oblique and transverse orientation, those muscles would internally rotate and contribute to horizontal adduction. So, if I have a presentation in which both of those muscles, or both of those, all of those fibers of those muscles, have a concentric orientation or a limitation present, or they're short, or whatever you want to call it, I don't really care, you would expect a concomitant ER and horizontal abduction limitation. Many times this is associated with reduction of posterior expansion in the thorax. So if I were to take this scapula and I'm lying flat, if I have reduced posterior expansion, the scapula would fall into adduction and external rotation. The humerus would follow suit. So when I bring the humerus up to the test position, in this case, the angle from the, uh, the subscapularis to the humerus is shortened, or it's more acute, whereas stuff on the backside, your external rotators, are more obtuse or long. Thus, I, sh I can show in this position that there's a concentric orientation of stuff on the front, subscap in this case, which is what would lead to the external rotation and horizontal abduction limitation. When that happens, your treatment then would be to get expansion posteriorly. Because once you do that, then instead of the scap being adducted and uh, externally rotated, you would be able to push it back to a, a, a normal position, which is a slight degree of protraction, and then you would have restoration of movement. The case that my man Mark is talking about, though, is where external rotation is clean, you still have a horizontal abduction limitation, but now internal rotation is limited. The way internal rotation would get limited is the opposite. If I have a pump handle that's down, or I have reduction of anterior chest wall expansion, the scapula is going to migrate into abduction and internal rotation. So it's going to slide around the outside. I'm going to do the same thing with my scap. So I abduct and internally rotate the scapula. When I bring the humerus to the testing position, which would be um, at that 90 degrees abduction, we can see now on the posterior aspect, this angle right here, the angle from your uh, external rotators, 
infraspinatus and teres minor to the humerus is more acute and then the subscap angle is more obtuse which means that I have concentric orientation or shortening or whatever of stuff on the backside, your external rotators. Thus, when you go into IR, you have a limitation. Also, if you go into horizontal adduction, you would have a limitation because these muscles would aid in horizontal abduction because infraspinatus also has transverse plane fibers. So now we have a case here where I have a mix. I have IR and a horizontal abduction limitation. What's likely going on in this case is you have a pump handle that's down, the pecs kick into high gear, probably drive a little bit of IR of the humerus to a degree, and then as a compensatory measure, you likely have compression of the, the uh, posterior thorax also in an exhaled state to try to, to circumvent that limitation. So essentially what happens is you have a degree of anterior and posterior compression in the upper thorax. So I have a pump handle that's down one and I have an exhaled posterior thorax two. When I have that A to P compression, then you start seeing these mixed patterns of limitations where I have an IR limitation and a horizontal abduction limitation. And it could be that as the, the thorax compensatorily goes into that exhaled position or it tips posteriorly, that gives you enough space so the ER is actually clearing. And now you have full external rotation secondary to the position of the rib cage and how that influences the scapular orientation. When that occurs, then it might look like you have a crap ton of external rotation, but the only reason you have that is because of the thorax posteriorly tipping as a, a unit, which allows you to clear the external rotation. Or actually, it would be, I'm sorry, it would be anterior tipping. Anterior tipping of the, of the scap in that regard that would allow the ER to, cl to clear. Because if I have, if I have a posterior tipping that's going to compress the scap up against the, uh, the ribcage further, uh, thus would reinforce the external rotation limitation. So it actually would be an anterior tip. Um, so with that in mind, what we have in this case is we have something happened anteriorly where I have a reduction of pump handle activity and I likely have a reduction of posterior expansion and the ER is cleared secondary to um, the, the thorax changing its orientation into the, into the anterior side of things. So, in this case, what you going to do about it? I'm glad you asked, Mark. What you're going to do about this uh, limitation is you need to do activities that would encourage anterior and posterior expansion simultaneously, which guess what? I debriefed about that last week, the inverted activities. So if you are able to tip someone up so their pelvis is higher than their thorax, that helps both diaphragms ascend. Um, it makes, makes ascension and descension of the diaphragms easier, allows for anterior and posterior expansion of the thorax. That's typically how I approach it. Now you could potentially segment this into doing anterior stuff first and posterior stuff second, but I generally find if you do A to P expansion simultaneously, that's been more effective. Again, kudos to Daddy O Pops, Bill Hartman for that. I will, I will most certainly link that in the show notes um, because I think it's a, uh, it's, it's some legit moves. So I'll link that debrief from last week and Bill. Um, but that's really what you would do. It's a, it's a mixed presentation, and that's why the limitation happens. So to summarize your question, Mark, the reason why you might see IR and horizontal abduction limited simultaneously is because of A to P compression, meaning I have a down pump handle and the posterior thorax is, is restricted or exhaled. That leads to a mixture of findings. There could be compensatory rotation or a tilting or orienting of the thorax that might clear ER when it shouldn't be cleared. Your treatment process should be tipping them up and inverting them so you can get A to P expansion and anything else you can utilize that would encourage that simultaneously. If you do those things, my man, you ought to be in business. Mark, that was a great question. Appreciate you asking it, big dog. Whew. The next question 
comes from Blake, or as he prefers to be called, Balake. He doesn't, but he's a friend, so. Here's his question. Someone with heavily flared ribs, and I mean heavy, especially in supine, what are your favorite positions to begin working this? I've tried a bunch of different things. What's your go-to? Hope to see, hope these help and hope to see you up north. Blake, great question. So heavily flared ribs. I'm not looking into rib flares as much. Um, I, I, the reason why rib flares would occur, which if you don't know what those are, I do have a whole debrief on rib flares, but essentially when the lower portion, this will be linked in the show notes tomorrow, but essentially when the lower portion of the rib cage is uh, visibly forward, that would be a rib flare. Um, you know, and, and we used to do things to kind of pull the ribs down to help with that. That likely happens secondary to the pelvis anteriorly tilting or orienting, regardless of the mechanism, and then a loss of abdominal activity, and then you get this huge rib flare. So you have this kind of C-curve shape in your spine that makes the lower ribs more prominent. That's not the show for me. What the show is for me in this case, Blake, in terms of getting the starting position, which is when we're trying to get rid of those rib flares, it's about engaging abs. But the show is the infrasternal angle in this case, which I, I've written a bunch on the infrasternal angle, or at least debriefed a bunch on it. Um, you want to make sure that you have multi or the you want to be able to have a dynamic infrasternal angle, I should say, meaning the bucket handle action should occur because that's really what we're measuring with the infrasternal angle. Do I have lateral and superior expansion and can I bring it down of the lower rib cage? If you can't do that, you probably got problems because you got a dynamic or a loss of dynamic movement within that region. So, what you gonna do about it? I'm glad you asked. The fix would be you want to make sure that you can restore dynamic capabilities of that and in that in the two examples that I would give is if you have a wide infrasternal angle you need to be able to narrow that angle bring the bucket handle down. In the narrow case, you have to be able to widen it, bring the bucket handle up. Starting position can have a huge influence on this. There's an article by Takashima et al. I'll link it in the show notes. It's a good one. Uh, Bill tuned me onto this and it, it really changed the way I start coaching basic breathing mechanics. But you can change the dimensions of the rib cage depending on what starting position you utilize. So if I can choose a position for someone who's narrow and I can make the rib cage wider, or if I could choose a starting position for someone who's wide that makes the rib cage narrow, that's going to bias the abdominals you want better, which will help restore the dynamics of the lower rib cage. So it's either going to help the lower ribs open up in the case of the narrow, or it's going to help close the rib angle in the case of the wide. According to this article, if you take someone and you put them in the supine position, the rib cage dimensions, medial and lateral, side to side, ought to expand. If I have someone who's a narrow infrasternal angle, I want that to happen. So what I often do when I'm teaching just basic breathing mechanics for these people is I will put them either in a 90-90 position, a hook line position, or anything where they're on their back. Because... That's going to help open up the rib cage the way I want them to, to do so. And generally what I've found is that position is easier for them to keep the stacked position of the, the rib cage over the pelvis. It's easier for them to tuck. The wide struggle, and I think one reason why that is, is because you're putting them in a position that puts them closer to their end range that they're already in. We don't want that. For a wide infrasternal angle, Side lying has been shown to reduce the lateral dimensions and you get increased A to P expansion. So I start most of my people with wide infrasternal angles in the side lying position. And with that, I do basically 90-90 in side lying. That's what I've been doing. Um, I'll link a, a couple of videos of some of my basic breathing coaching stuff in the show notes. Um, but that's what I've been doing is I, I basically coach the same exercise, but I just change the position. And it's been amazing how much easier it is for people who are wide to tuck in that side-lying position. Because 
um, they don't have this huge lordosis to overcome anymore now against gravity. Um, that's been incredibly useful for these people. In terms of the side lying, I will generally start people on their right side. This, again, is something I learned from, from Bill. Um, but what that does is your, your organs have certain lines of force that they pull on the body, in particular the, the guts, the, the, the uh, intestines. They attach from L1 to L2 and then they go on the left side and they go across to the sacrum. And so they have a little bit of a leftward pull to them. You can reduce that leftward pull by lying someone on their right side. And I found that that's actually been very useful for getting someone to get that tucked position. Um, so again, kudos to Bill for, for figuring that out. Um, but that's really where I start these people. And if you do that and you coach the, the tucking and the breathing mechanics savagely well, a lot of times you will see a reduction in rib flares if that's something you're looking at. But most importantly, you're going to see changes in mobility. You'll see that the lower rib cage will be more dynamic. You'll probably see changes in hip extension because they'll be able to tilt more effectively. And you'll probably get better results. So to summarize your question, Balake or Blake, what I would do, starting positions for someone with heavily flared ribs, depends on the infrasternal angle. Lie people on their back if they're a narrow because that widens the rib cage. Lie someone who's wide on their side because that narrows the rib cage. And coach the basics like you know how to do. And you ought to get some real nice changes. So Blake, unbelievable question. Before I dive into this last question though, if you don't know how to coach those breathing mechanics and you want to learn from someone like me, because you need that fundamental piece, not just for pain, because being able to get that stacked position of the rib cage underneath the pelvis, while it can improve movement and help with pain, that's an essential piece for performance. When you're gonna squat big weight, you gotta be able to generate intra-abdominal pressure, fam. And if you can't keep this stacked, you're not gonna be able to pressurize effectively. You might be leaving some weight on the barbell. And we don't want that. So what I want you to do instead is come to Human Matrix because we will teach you that and more. We got quite a few locations this year. We have May 18th and 19th, San Antonio, Texas. Next week, you better sign up. There's going to be a really good group there. Tons of good people are going to be at that one. Um, June 8th and 9th, New York City. The early bird ends this Friday at 11.55 p.m., and I think there's only two spots available, folks. This thing is going to sell out like your favorite rapper. Um, you probably want to sign up for this, and man, the, the group for that is straight fire. Tons of all-stars at that one. I'm pretty excited for that one. August 3rd and 4th, Cincinnati, Ohio. August 24th and 25th in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, September 21st and 22nd in Raleigh, North Carolina. October 5th and 6th in Boston, Massachusetts, and December 7th and 8th in Orlando. And you can bet your bottom dollar, I'm probably going to be hitting up Universal Studios when I go to Orlando this time. So, hey, if you want to stick around, hang out, let's do it. But I hope to see you there. Without further ado, the last question comes from <clears throat> Senorita Lucy. And she says, Zach, my fam... What's good with you? Does a personal trainer have a role in someone's recovery journey from persistent pain? Whew, this one's a tough one. Great question, Lucy. And uh, <clears throat> I want to say yes, but what I'm going to actually say is it depends. And the reason why I'm going to say is it depends, is it depends on what you are comfortable with in your skill set. I think what skills a personal trainer could acquire most certainly have a role with someone in persistent pain. Because I'll tell you what, as a PT, there's some PTs who I know who I would not send anyone, well, anyone, one, but two, I wouldn't send someone who's been in persistent pain to, to a physical therapist. So that's why I'm hesitant to saying yes, um, because I really think it depends on what skill set the practitioner has. Some people aren't just meant to work with those types of people because someone in persistent pain requires a multifactorial approach. And that's where someone such as a personal trainer can be useful. And the reason why they can be useful is because a personal trainer is looking at a lot of different factors to improve someone's health and well-being. They're getting them moving, which is great. 
they'll be able to see them more frequently than just about any other practitioner can. You know, I'm lucky to see people twice a week where I'm at. Online, it's once a week, every two weeks, to two to six weeks. I mean, it, it really varies. So they have frequency uh, to, to help them. But they can get them moving more consistently, more frequently. They can do education on sleep and carry out the educational plan on sleep. They can carry out nutrition plans. Uh, a personal trainer's potential skill set is vast. There's some personal trainers who can also do things with functional medicine. And all of this stuff could be useful for someone in persistent pain. Because if I'm exercising, that has a pain relieving effect. It's anti-inflammatory in nature, so is good nutrition. You can teach the people in persistent pain so many skills that could help improve their health, which by doing that will subsequently, more often than not, improve pain. Obviously, I say this after big bad things have been ruled out, but that's usually what the case is in persistent pain. So to say that when someone is having pain to immediately refer out, I don't think in acute instances probably warranted, but in someone who's got persistent pain, it may not be. It may be you are the right person for them, or maybe and probably more uh, importantly, you're working together with a team to address all the potential reasons that this individual could be having a stuck in a persistent pain state. And that can range from a team effort of the, the personal trainer, the strength coach, the physical therapist, the psychologist, the dentist, uh, whoever. I mean, it, it could really be anything. Um, but what's nice about personal trainers is because they will see clients more often than anyone else, they can carry out the game plans of, uh, that may be set up by a lot of practitioners. And that's where, uh, you know, Chris Kresser, who I'll link in the show notes, does, does a great job of, of creating this relationship. Um, he has a certification for health coaches. So what, what he would do is, he's a functional med guy, he would provide some type of functional medicine protocol and have the, the, the uh, coach carry out that protocol. So these are your, your, your stewards who can make sure that while the person is on their journey, they're staying on the path and they're not veering off. Because I think that's a lot of times where we fail with, with persistent pain. Is it's, it is a long, long road. And you have to be militant and consistent and stay on that road in order to get to where you want to be. Just like someone who's obese and is trying to lose fat. It's, it's the same thing. You need consistency. You need hard work, and you need to be persistent. And the more people you have to in your corner to help you stay on that road and make it there, I'm all for. And so I think a personal trainer does have a big role for someone in persistent pain, assuming that they have that skill set. But I would say that for anyone. So to summarize your wonderful question, Lucy, personal trainer does have a role because... They can see people more frequently than any other practitioner. They can get people moving in a safe manner, assuming you're coaching them very well. They can carry out nutrition plans, encourage sleep, and other lifestyle things that can improve the person's health, one, but the healthier that that individual gets, the more likely they are to improve from their persistent pain. But what I think is the real big key is having a team approach to helping these people get out of persistent pain or recover from their persistent pain state. Because a lot of times these people in persistent pain have multifactorial reasons for being in pain and they likely need a multifactorial and team approach to get to where they want to be. So Lucy, unbelievable question. What's good with you, girl? I think that's a good stopping point for us tonight. I want to thank all of you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people for tuning in. If you want to learn more about Big Z, Here's where you can find me. Go to ZachCouples.com. Sign up for my newsletter. You'll get almost five hours of me talking. You're going to get a free acute to chronic workload calculator. And every Friday, I'm going to tell you what's good on the internet. You'll definitely want to sign up for that. And once you've done that, then you'll want to go over to my services. If you want me to coach you through some of those basic breathing mechanics, because maybe you are in persistent pain, you've ruled out the bad stuff, and you're thinking, hey, you know what? If I move better, maybe I can get help. I'll be your guy. What we'll do is I'll take you through a full evaluation. We will figure out where your movement limitations are, see if we can restore those movement limitations, and get you where you need to go. Or maybe you want to figure out how to do that with your peeps. Well, I can mentor you on that because I can walk you through 
the process that I go through with my people, we'll have good back and forth discussion and we'll tailor your learning program so it helps the people you work with first and foremost. Or maybe you have gone down that journey, you're Gucci, as the kids say, and you want to get gains. I can write a training program for you as well using some of the movement uh, assessment that we do so it's specifically tailored to your needs to maximize your goals. Whether it's muscle gains, fat loss, post rehab, you just want to feel good, I don't care, I work with it all. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com, the next thing you're going to want to do is find me on iTunes and Stitcher at the Zach Couple Show. Because guess what, folks? There's 82 other debriefs. Do you really want to look at me for all of them? I wasn't bald and beautiful. Well, actually, I was bald and beautiful for all of them, but I didn't have this great beard. So you probably want to, you know, maybe just listen to me on iTunes for those. But if you do, leave a review so we can have the fam grow. On social media, you can find me at Facebook, forward slash Z Couples. The Twitter handle is at Z Couples. I'm on that Instagram, baby. It's Zach, Z-A-C, Couples, C-P-P-L-E-S. And if you want to go to YouTube, that is like gold mine right there because I put all of the new moves that I've been doing with people on YouTube. Uh, you'll definitely want to check me out. Just search Zach Couples. You ought to find me. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you all keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.